uh, down swings in the chat, you think, oh my god, I'm the most unlucky player in the world. I've lost four tournaments in a row. What should I do? And we'll discuss how to deal with downswings, cope with downswings, and learn, ideally, to not care so much about downswings because, at the end of the day, you simply need to learn to win at poker. I know I've discussed these three things about 1,400 times on this YouTube channel, but seriously, you have to do three things to win at poker. Number one, find a game you can beat. Number two, play it a lot. And number three, keep a proper bankroll. Now, you're certainly still going to have downswings and upswings. But if you're playing with an edge and you are winning at poker, money will trickle your direction. So first things first, you need to figure out how much you're winning or losing. You need to quantify your edge. Now, this is sometimes easier said than done, especially in games with a lot of variance, like multi-table tournaments or Pot Limit Omaha. So you may not have a sample size to know what your win rate is, but you can ask around and get good data and figure out roughly how other players similar to you are doing in the games. Is this live? Yes. So you have to be very realistic. A lot of people think that their results over a short run matters. So many people come to me and say, oh man, I won my first like seven tournaments and then I've lost 50 in a row. What's going on? And they're up like 200% return on investment, you know? And the answer is uh, nothing, variance. You're probably running hot if anything, even though you're on a downswing, you know? You have to realize that especially in multi-table tournaments, you're always going to be down from your peak because that's how tournaments work. You trickle down, trickle down, trickle down, win. Trickle down, trickle down, trickle down, win. And so you're usually going to perhaps naturally feel bad about how you're doing, which is not great for most people's mindset. So what do I recommend? First things first, be very realistic. I learned this from my first poker coach, Bill Seymour, a long time ago. He said, take a look at your win rate, divide it in half, and then divide it in half again. One fourth your win rate. See how you're doing. Try to make a point to be able to live off of that amount or less, ideally. So keep expenses low. And this was amazing advice for young John Little because I didn't know what I was doing. And look, I didn't really spend a ton of money back then, but it's good to know that don't take money out of your bankroll, right? I mean, a lot of people think if they went at poker, they're supposed to go buy a new hat or buy some shoes. And that's certainly not ideal if you are actually trying to win at poker long term because any money you take out of your bankroll essentially opens you up to having less money to play with, right? So essentially, I recommend you all presume you're winning less than you observe. How much less? Probably not 75% less. That's a little bit egregious, but that helped ensure I never went anywhere near going broke throughout my entire poker career. I know a lot of players out there, they think it's fun to have giant swings. They like losing 70% of their money. I personally don't like losing 70% of my money. That doesn't vibe so well with me. I like losing 4% of my money, maybe 8% of my money. <laughs> now you may say, you're just not making good use of the other 92%. But look, that money's invested. It's locked away. It's it's not coming out. So, I mean, look, obviously you're going to go down swings. Get used to it. Accept it. But an easy way to screw up winning at poker is to think that you're way better than you are. Someone asked me yesterday, I was playing a poker tournament. They asked me if we were to play Zoom poker six-handed for 10,000 hands, what are the odds that I, Jonathan Little, would win more money than this other player who is, you know, plays a lot of poker, but it's not a professional poker player. You know what my answer was? I think I'll probably be up more than this player maybe 55% of the time. Maybe. Maybe not even that. And he was surprised. He thought it'd be like two to one or something, or maybe he didn't think it'd be two to one, but at two to one, he'd like want to take the action. And I bet he's asked other good players who perhaps have ego problems and think they're amazing. And they're like, oh yeah, I win every time. But look, 10,000 hands is not a lot. I'm going to show you in just a minute how few hands 10,000 hands is. And you got to be realistic. 
That said, if you definitively know that you have a positive win rate, money will flow in your direction. I remember a long time ago, I was playing sit and goes, and I would play roughly 3,000 per month, sometimes a little bit more, usually not a whole lot less. And I would win consistently over the course of two years, 10 months out of 12. The other two months, I would break even or lose a little. Did those losing months bother me? Because I was playing all the time. And losing. Sometimes. And the answer is no. Because I knew, definitively, I had a solid win rate. Now, I'm going to discuss some things to do whenever you are in a downswing in a little bit um, coming up in, the, in, a, in a few minutes. But the answer is not like quit and cry or complain or moan. The answer is continue playing in a game where you have a nice edge. So, play a lot. If you have an edge, play a lot because volume cures variance. In the long run, if you have a positive win rate, you will win. If you do not have a positive win rate, you will lose. That's the great thing about gambling games. This is how the casino operates. Notice they have a bunch of roulette wheels spinning all the time in Las Vegas and all the other casinos. And that's because they know they win. It's very, very clear and easy to define their edge based on the number of zeros on the wheel. And if you do spike on them three times in a row and hit a one in 36 or one in 39 in Vegas now, you, they'll celebrate, they'll high five, they'll clap, they'll cheer, they'll give you comps. Something wrong with my chair. They'll give you comps. They're happy to have you there, even though you're winning. Why? Because they know definitively they have an edge. And poker is very similar. You can very often know somewhat definitively that you have an edge, especially if you've put in a lot of volume already and you have a very clear track record. Now recognize that poker is a little bit more difficult to define your edge sometimes because the game changes. Your opponents change, their strategies change, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And that sometimes makes it a little bit more dicey, right? I mean, I'll, I'll give you a good example. The tournaments in the Poker Go studio can range from very good in terms of value, I mean value meaning profitability for the poker players, um, to not a good value. There are probably, let's say, 20-ish recreational players who play those tournaments regularly. And if 20 of them show up, the game's going to be great. If two of them show up, the game's not going to be good. And so you cannot be egotistical and think, oh, I win X amount in these tournaments on average. Say so you think you're going to win 10% on average. You may be winning more than that if the game's super soft. You may be winning way less than that or even losing if the game is tough. And so you have to be smart about it, right? Also worth noting, if you do play a lot, you will find that your focus, and therefore your edge, may get worse as you play many hours or many tables at a time. Um, back in the day when I was playing sit and goes, when I really started ramping up the volume, I found that I could win at something like 8% return on investment playing four tables at a time, or about 4% return on investment playing 16 tables at a time. Half as much. Why? Because I wasn't seeing everything. I, I was lacking focus because I was spreading my attention from four tables up to 16, right? The question though, should I play 16 tabling or four? Well, obviously, if you only care about winning money and you don't care about variance, you should play 16 tables because if you think about it, 8% return on investment times four is let's say 32, but four times 16 is what? More than 32, it's 64, is that right? 64. So would you rather get out, let's say 0.64 or 0.32 in exchange for a whole lot more variance? Well, I was always happy to push it a little bit and accept more variance in exchange for more money. Now, this may not be the case if you're working on a smaller bankroll. If your bankroll is smaller, you cannot accept quite as big of edges. I'm sorry. If, you're, if your bankroll is smaller, you cannot accept smaller edge gambles in exchange for more variance. But being able to put in volume will often, I'm not going to say totally override it because it won't, but if you're properly bankrolled, you should be happy to play games where you have a small-ish edge, assuming the variance is not like super duper through the roof, like in Sit and Goes it wasn't. Um, so yeah, recognize also that as you play more hours of live poker, you'll find that your focus may get worse as well. Uh, back whenever I used to play at Bellagio, 5, 10, and 10, 20, no limit every day, I would typically play about 12 hours a day at most. This is not ideal for making money. Why? 
because I would usually pack it up at about midnight or 1 a.m. every single day. I'd start at noon, play until midnight. If the game was especially good, I'd say until like 2 a.m. But I would not be the type of player who's going to put in these marathon 47-hour sessions. I think that's kind of absurd. That said, I was really prioritizing life balance at that point in my life, and I wanted to make sure I was awake during normal hours, you know, normal non-poker hours, and I also wanted to hang out with my girlfriend at the time. And that's important, right? So you have to figure out what you actually care about. But if I cared about making money, I probably would have showed up to the casino at something like 8 p.m. and stayed until 6 a.m. and probably made more money in a shorter amount of time. Wouldn't 16 tabling introduce less variance? Well, you're going get to through, get through to the, lo the long run in a shorter period of time, but your edge is going to be smaller, right? As your edge is smaller, you're going to have bigger swings, right? So you're going to have bigger swings, but you'll get through those swings faster. You have to realize time is not actually the metric you should be using to measure your poker results. I mean, I've had people come to me and say, I'm on a crazy downswing. I haven't won in nine months. And then I'm like, okay, how many tournaments have you played? Like, oh, I play once a week. I'm like, okay, you've played 40 tournaments. It's like nothing, right? So you played 40 tournaments, you've done poorly. Who cares? That's like standard, right? But if you played a tournament every day for nine months, that's very different. You have to realize time is not the correct metric that you need to be looking at at all. A lot of people want to say, oh, I've won X weeks in a row, X months in a row, X years in a row. No, 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 no. You want to be looking at how many tournaments you've played and how many hands you've played if, for cash games. Recognize, though, that as you play a lot, your edge may get smaller. And if you're playing with a small edge to begin with, that small edge can easily become neutral or negative. And if you uh, are losing, well, that's obviously very, very bad. Next, keep a proper bankroll. I discussed this a million times. Google Jonathan Little Bankroll on YouTube, Twitter, whatever. Check out pokercoaching.com slash bankroll for a gigantic article on bankroll. Management, recognize that you will experience downswings even if your edge is decently large. So plan ahead. Understand that variance is, understand the variance that is inherent to your game. A lot of people don't. I'm going to give you some examples in just a second, so don't leave. Recognize that you will experience variance. How can you put in good volume playing tournaments? They take ages. Yes. Recognize tournaments are pretty bad for making money, especially at the small and medium stakes. Why? Because if you're playing live poker, you may only get to play one or two entries per day. Probably two entries per day on average if you're playing professionally slash full time. And that's only 700 tournaments a year. 700 tournaments a year is not a lot. That's like a very busy online weekend. Ah, maybe a few weekends. So, what can you do? Well, the answer is, maybe that's not a good thing to do if you want to make money consistently. Maybe instead you need to be playing small and medium stakes cash games, which is what I recommend a ton of people do if you're going to be focusing on live poker. Online, you can play way more tables and get through many, many more games. So this is not so relevant for online. But live, um, yeah, tournaments are pretty bad for building a bankroll because say you're playing a $100 buy-in tournament and you're winning at 20% return on investment and it takes four hours to play on average, you're making $20 over the course of four hours. It's $5 an hour. It's not a good win rate at all in terms of hourly rate. You should go get a job instead and make twice that, right? Or say you're playing $500 buy-in tournaments and you're making, let's say, $150 over the course of four hours. You know, now it's, what? Let me do math. 37, 40 bucks, whatever. It's 40 bucks an hour. And that's still not great. And this is the interesting thing. I mean, do I even go here? I see a lot of people chasing clout in exchange for not making any money. So many people will travel to play a tournament series where every day there's something like one $200 buy-in tournament or one $500 buy-in tournament. And they're making a whopping $150 a day, spending $100 a day on a hotel room, $20 extra on food, plus they have to fly down there to play. And it, it's not a good risk-reward ratio. Essentially, you play all day with a decent edge and you break even. And that's not good. Multiple tournaments at the same time online is a solution, question mark. 
if you play online poker and you're not playing like at least four tables at a time, you're not doing it right. You are squandering your opportunity and squandering your time. Most of the time when you're playing poker online, you're not doing anything. You're just sitting there. Think about when you're playing live poker. Most of the time, you're not doing anything. You're just sitting there. Fortunately, online, you can play a lot of tables. Like I just said, I played 16 at a time when I was playing, sometimes more when I was playing multi-table tournaments. DK says, three-month downswing. Again, time does not matter. Time does not matter. How do you determine if you have an edge or if you're just lucky? Quantify it. Pay attention. How are you winning? How are you losing? One summer at the World Series, I was pushing up the stakes. I was playing a lot of 50, 100, 100, 200 cash games in, the, in my spare time, and I ran badly. I didn't play a ton. Probably played, I don't know, 5,000 hands, 3,000 hands, not a lot. But I got it all in something like 10 times, and I lost eight of them. And I was roughly flipping or better the majority of them. But I lost eight out of 10. And eight out of 10, $20,000 flips will result in you losing. I never started the stream on YouTube. It sure looks like I did. People are typing in YouTube. Um, so recognize that you will have downswings and that is fine and that is normal. Make sure you understand the variance that's inherent to your game. A lot of people don't. Let's talk about coping mechanisms for bad mindsets. For example, DK here. I'm losing every hand. It doesn't matter. If that's your thought process, you have a bad mindset. Because who cares if you're losing every hand? It's normal. Get used to it. I realize a lot of people like to complain about their bad luck because that's what all their friends do. I'd recommend you find new friends. In my friend group, whenever someone's on a downswing, it's like a joke because they know it happens. We all know it happens. It's standard. It's normal. Get used to it. These are all band-aids. These are not solutions. These are things to do if you have a bad mindset. So, first things first, take some time away from poker. Stop playing so much. Get over it. It's okay. Especially if you're not a professional. If you're a professional, well, you have no other options, really. You don't need to just be taking time off because if you don't play, you don't make money. And if you don't make money, well, that's not good. Next, study poker instead of playing. It is presumed that if you're on a big downswing, it's more likely that you are losing or you don't have the edge you think in your game compared to what you think you have. You think you have an edge, but you may not have that edge. If you're crushing the game, odds are maybe you've underestimated your edge. Just on average, this is how poker works. On any individual session, if you're getting crushed, odds are you're losing in that game, depending on how you get crushed, right? If you get aces all in five times and lose them all, who cares? If you bluff it off and your opponents call you with middle pair every time or something like that, then, you know, maybe not. Anyway, if you may not have the edge that you think you have, you should be studying poker. I highly recommend everyone study poker a ton. A ton, a ton, a ton. I have a poker training site, pokercoaching.com. Check it out. That's important. Um, if you are not studying poker a lot, you're messing up, especially if you are moving up to the medium or high stakes. You're waiting for three hacks to crush online tournaments. That was a mistake. Go ignore that one. How do you measure your edge? You're just guessing. Well, look, keep track of your results. Obviously, keep track of your results. I'm sorry, I should have said that at the start of the video. Keep track of your results in all forms of gambling and investing and all that. If you don't know how much you're winning or losing, on average, over your short sample, you're just guessing. Now, I'm about to tell you some estimations for rougher win rates so that you can have some idea. The thing is, it's like in live tournaments, you'll have no clue what a good win rate is because, or a win rate if you're only looking at your own results because your own results are very limited. There are some really, really good poker players who I think are better than me, who have far worse results than I do. Why would that be? Well, they're running bad or they've just ran badly kind of towards the end of the tournament. Um, I mean, I'll, I'll give, use myself as an example. For the last year, I've been playing a decent amount of tournaments in the Poker Go studio, and I had a lot of fifth to ninth place finishes. Like, almost no first, seconds, or thirds. Did I presume I was bad at poker? No, because I realize I play, I get some chips, I lose a flip, I lose an all-in, and I'm out. Okay, don't lose the last flip. Instead of taking fifth, you win, right? And... I was happy to continue showing up and playing. I thought I had at least some edge and we've rattled off three wins over the last few months, which is great. 
I'm now all of a sudden I'm like the best poker player in the world. No, it's variance. I won, won my flips at the end, won my hands at the end, right? Everyone asking about this YouTube video, three hacks. We did that a few days ago. My team screwed up. Go watch that on YouTube from a few days ago. We're talking about downswings now. You won the Poker Go series, though. You must be the best player in the world. Yeah, exactly. Variance, right? A lot of people don't, don't get that. They think that the people who are winning must be the best players in the world. And, you know, certainly there is. Vari I mean, look, there's variance, right? I mean, when I won Player of the Year. You see that giant trophy up there? You can't even see it. It's like see-through glass. That one right there. I got this trophy for winning Player of the Year. Now, was I the best player in the world at that time? Maybe. But I also ran ungodly hot. And every year, whoever wins player of the year ran un runs ungodly hot. And for some reason, the media tries to make people think that the person who's running ungodly hot is the best player. Because it's they, they sell sensationalism, right? And I mean, like, it is what it is. Nothing wrong with that. Maybe there's something wrong with that. Who knows? But it's important to understand what's actually happening. What's actually realistic? Should you celebrate the person that ran the hottest? Maybe. It's like at the casino when someone wins a lot of money at a slot machine. They celebrate. Why are they celebrating? They got lucky. Who cares if you get lucky? Anyway, study a lot more than you play. Like anything in life, if you want to get good at it, you got to study a ton. Most people don't study nearly enough. Um, move down in stakes if things are going poorly. Um... I realize that some people, if they're not playing their normal game, they play worse because they don't care as much. If you have that mindset, you're probably not going to win at poker. Is that a bad thing to say? Um, if you if you can't show up and play well for any amount of money or zero dollars even, for at least some amount of time, I'm not sure you have the right mindset to win at poker because you're not always going to feel motivated to play. Simple as that. If you're a professional take some time away from poker may not be an, op an option, especially if you don't have a big bankroll yet or a lot of money set aside, right? So you should be, you should make a point to move down in stakes. You should make a point to be sane and ensure you have the edge that you think you have and that you're playing reasonably well. How many buy-ins do you need per games? Go to pokercoaching.com slash bankroll. All right, understand variance. At some point you are definitively going to run far worse than you ever thought possible. I was taught this by one of my friends named Irie Guy back when I was probably 18 or 19 years old. And he talked about going on some insane downswing and I thought, oh, that'll never happen to me. And then I went on a downswing like twice as bad. <laughs> um, recognize whatever you've been through, it can get worse. Okay. So think about, think about your worst downswing. Just think about it. Actually, actually quantify what it is. I've had two really bad downswings in tournaments. I'll tell you what they are. They're both actually very similar. Two times I had zero caches at the World Series of Poker, despite playing a relatively full schedule, about 40 something tournaments. O for X in 40. Now look, caching does not really matter. I think a lot of people think, oh, I got a cache, that's good. Caching is actually irrelevant. Not irrelevant, but kind of irrelevant. If you are measuring your success by cash percentage, you're a fish and you're not going to make it. Am I allowed to say that? Yeah, I'm allowed to say that. Cash percentage doesn't matter. So you have to realize slugging percentage, how often you actually win the tournament or take a, make a very deep run is what actually matters. So did I care that I lost 40 tournaments in a row the first time? Yeah, I thought, what, what in the world is happening? Actually, I knew it was happening. I literally played eight hours every day, get it all in with ace king or queens or jacks or something and lose. It happened every day, for like 40 days. Did I think the world was rigged? No. Did I think that the poker gods hated me? No. Did I think that I was being cheated? No. I already learned variants exist. So I didn't take it too badly. I mean, certainly I wasn't loving it. Didn't love losing a bunch of money, but it happens. Fortunately for me, right after the World Series, I showed up, played another tournament, and won it for a million dollars. That'll help. That's lucky. A few years later, I did the exact same thing. O for X at the World Series again. <laughs> you may ask, were you out partying all night? No. Were you uh, DJing, gambling, and other stuff? No. I was literally showing up, playing as well as I thought I knew how to play, and losing. 
Again, I was lucky. I want a million bucks right after it again. Fine. Lucky player. But 0 for 40. To most people, if they go 0 for 40, they um they start to get sad and depressed. Most people, if they go 0 for 8, they get sad and depressed, which happens all the time. So you have to understand variance. So if you know what is normal or inherent to your game, prepare for it. Plan for it. Don't be sad when it happens. I knew back then I needed 300 buy-ins to play tournaments. So if you lose 40, fine. Recognize, I could have lost 40 and then 40 more playing well. That happens. At what point do you accept a downswing isn't just variance and you are playing poorly? You have to analyze your play. I've always studied my play. I mean, I write down hands all the time. I used to have tons of notebooks. Now I write them in my phone. But write down your hands. Study them. Recognize that if you're not reviewing your play and asking what is happening here, not just in your all-ins and not just in your bust-out hands, but in all the hands, you're probably a fish. If you're not analyzing your play, you're not going to make it. Should you change seats in cash games where you're not getting good cards? No. You should change seats based on who you want position on. You'd be disgusted if you lost 40. LOL. I'll stick to cash games. You can run badly in cash games. <laughs> Get used to that too. That'll happen. <sighs> Tournament variance feels a lot worse though because you're always down from your peak. Whereas in cash games, usually the downswings are not so bad, but you can break even for a long time. Breaking even playing cash games is rough. It feels bad because I think a lot of people think that they win X amount per hour, especially if they've seen it in the past for like a year. And then you break even for like three months and you're like, what in the world is happening? I'm literally sitting here grinding. I do. I want nothing for three months. It's better than losing, of course. But you have to understand what is inherent to the game. And if you're not cool with that, maybe the game's not for you. Do I have a video on how to review your hands? I review poker hands all the time at pokercoaching.com. Go there. Check out the Tournament Masterclass and the Cash Game Masterclass. Okay. Let's take a look at some uh, some random samples. This is from a site called PokerDope.com. This site's been around forever. It's a great variance calculator. It's not 100% accurate for the real world in that you don't play buy-ins of all the same... You don't play tournaments of all the same buy-in level, but whatever. Maybe it can do that now. I don't even know. Whatever. We're going simple today. Let me show you what we were looking at here. We're looking at 20 100-game samples of tournaments with a 30% return on investments. You may say, oh, I win way higher than 30% return on investments. You probably don't. A lot of people think that they're winning at 100% return on investment or more. And I hate to break it to you, unless you're playing a really slow structured game against really bad players with relatively low rake, you're not winning at more than 30% return on investment. If you're buying action from people on poker stake where I sell action, and you're paying more than 1.2. You're not going to make much or any money. Hate to break it to you. I sell a 0% markup, by the way, because I want to give you all a bit of a sweat. Isn't 15% ROI great? No, 30% is. I think 30% is doable for very, very good players across the board in most standard-ish events. Now, in main events, if you're very good, you'll probably have a bigger edge than 30%. Main events, like five day long tournaments, you know? Um, unfortunately, most main main events now have become somewhat turbo to where they're like three day tournaments. Like I just played at the win. Their main event that had a thousand players took three days. I mean, that's like kind of turbo. Um, so recognize like in that tournament, you may have 30% ROI if you're great. Certainly not a hundred, but in something like the World Series main event, or I don't even know what a good example is anymore. Any tournament that takes like five days is super slow. You get in the money on like day three. I think you can have like more like 75% return on investment. Um, anyway, let's take a look at this. What are we looking at? Every line here is a sample of 100 games. So one time the player ran ungodly hot. This is in $10, $100 buy-in tournaments. And they won like 40,000, 45,000 bucks. Okay. As you can see here, they lost for the first 25 games. They spiked. They broke even for a while, spiked a little bit, broke even for a while, spike, spike, spike. This is a lucky player. Player of the year. They're so good. This player down here just got completely crapped on. It looks like they have <laughs> one, two caches for like two buy-ins or three buy-ins. Besides that, they just lost for 100. 
Um, notice the zero line is somewhere right in here. With a 30% return on investment over 100 games, which is like what a lot of people play in a year, you'll have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight losing years roughly out of 20 in live poker if you play three tournaments a week. Fine, good, normal. Again, this is just like a random sample of 100. If you, I mean, a random sample of 20x 100 games with 30% ROI. If you ran this more and more and more, you'd see sometimes you have big, sometimes you have uh, more po uh, positive spots, sometimes you're more negative. It's variance. This is not, this is just a, a sample, right? What I want to show though is that look at how often you're having like a big win. It's like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven times out of 100. I'm sorry, seven times out of 20, you're having like a pretty nice win for like 10,000 bucks, 100 buy ins in the year. All the other times you're just getting crapped on. What's the site where you sell action? Pokerstake.com. I sell action at no markup, and Dale Negreanu sells action at no markup. I think those are very good spots to get action because we are trying to sell action to fans. Do not buy action at a big markup. You will not win. Unless, of course, you want to pay for a sweat. But paying high markup for sweat, I do not think is ideal because you're not going to win. I want to teach you all to make money, not to DJ and gamble. All right, what if you have negative 10% ROI? Look at this. This player won 33000 bucks with a negative 10% ROI over 100 games. This player would definitively think that they're very good at poker. If you take 20 random people with negative 10% ROI, you throw them in the game, and they win $32,000 playing $100 buying games, you can be very sure that player is going to think they are great, even though they're losing long-term. You may say, but, but they won a lot. How are they losing? Every single player here had negative 10% ROI. These guys just ran hot. This one, this one, and this one. Three out of the 20 ran hot with a bad return on investment. Actually, not even that bad. This is like losing the rake, right? So, notice, lots of losers. Lots and lots and lots and lots of losers. Suited and Boop says, negative 10% ROI. All they had to do was max late reg, and they're winning. Recognize that if you don't know how to play well short stack, you're not winning if you max late reg. A lot of people think, oh, max late reg, get 15%. I read that document by Kenny. Yeah, if you're really, really good, you can make your 10 or 15% ROI max late regging. Most people aren't really, really good at poker. I don't know if you played poker recently. I was just at the win playing 3,500s, 10Ks. There's a lot of players who are not good at poker. Not that it helped me on that trip. I lost. We're down here in the loser's lounge. It happens, right? Over my six tournament sample. But a lot of people aren't very good at poker, especially with a short stack. So many people think that poker is easy with a short stack, and it's not. I hate to break it to you. If you've gone through the advanced tournament course at pokercoaching.com, look down there. It's actually advertised. How do I point there? Down there. The event, in the advanced tournament course, we discuss how to play lots of intricate shallow stack spots. And it's it's hard. You got to know when to put in that check min raise when you defend with some trash and you flop an overcard and a backdoor gut shot and backdoor flush draw. And it's dicey. It's hard. So realize you can't think that there's some simple system to crush tournament poker. A lot of people want to think that, but it's not. And I hate to break it to you, Everyone's losing 10% right off the bat if they're break even. So what you're saying is, LOL, can't they just buy in late and win? No, everyone's losing. On average, across everyone. On average, everyone's paying the rake. When you pay the rake, especially if it's 10% or more, as it is in most tournaments, you're losing. It's hard to overcome that 10% rake. Okay, what about over 1,000 games? Over a thousand games, 10 years of live poker, three tournaments a week, 30% return on investment. Notice this black line, by the way, is the actual expected results just trickling up. Here's the break even line right here. One, two, three times over 10 years with a 30% solid return on investment, three people lost, three out of 20 lost with a very good win rate, consistent good win rates. The biggest loser lost about $30,000, 300 buy-ins. That player's going to think they're bad at poker. They're going to think they're bad at poker, even though they're actually good. And that's unfortunate. That's a harsh truth to the game. Now, a lot of people think, oh, that's me. Now, look, this is 10 years. A lot of you haven't lost. Most people, after about right here, 
and they decide they're done with it. <laughs> they're like, nope, nope, not for me. And, you know, it is what it is, right? It's important to realize that variants exist. Now, this player up here who won 1,500 buy-ins, pretty much straight up, this player's gonna think they're the best player ever. This is the player who wins player of the decade. Are they the best player ever? Or are they just running hot? They're just running hot. I can see plenty of it right here, right? They're obviously just running hot. So should we celebrate that player and say, oh yeah, they're great. They have 100% ROI. Because in reality, I just want to show you this, by the way. This is what 30% would be. You're winning like 25K. So this is 30, 60, 9. This is about 100% return on investment. They should, should have ran at 30, but instead they ran hot and they won at 100. Just variance. Someone's going to run hot. Hopefully it's you. Probably won't be, but hopefully it's you. Notice this player even, who was the biggest crusher of the decade, broke even. Actually lost a little bit for about 350 games out of the thousand. A third of the time over this 10-year sample playing three tournaments a week, they broke even. And they're a crusher. Keep that in mind. What about if you have negative 10% ROI? Look at this player. They still won 80,000 bucks. One super lucky player, one super lucky bad player won 800 buy-ins over the course of their 10-year sample. Isn't that crazy? This player's bad, and they won 800 buy-ins. Not terrible bad, but just, you know, okay. I like to hope a lot of you are not terrible bad here, by the way. I didn't even pull up if you have negative 60% ROI or something. Those all just go straight down. <laughs> You're not going to do it. Um, so anyway, as you see, more often than not, as you're worse, you're going to lose, right? Notice uh, uh, way more losers over a thousand games, right? Still a few winners though. And if we ran this for 10,000 games, there'd be almost no winners at negative 10% ROI. And if you ran it for a hundred thousand games, there would be no winners for negative 10% ROI. On this side, if we ran it for a hundred thousand games, it'd be like all winners or close enough to all winners, probably all winners. I say 100,000 games, 10,000 games, 10,000 and 100,000 games, whatever. You, there's gonna be way more winners as time progresses, right? If you have an edge, everything's gonna trickle up. What do you think about a player that let's say they play 2,200 samples, average stake of 10 buy-ins, 20% ROI, 4,000 bucks profit. Um, That math doesn't sound right to me. 20% ROI is $2 per game. Oh yeah, okay, 4,000 bucks profit. What would I say about that? I don't know, good solid player. I tell you to move up, move up where you make more money. Okay, what about cash games? This chart's a bit more cluttered. Again, 20, 10,000 hand samples with 20 big blind per 100 hand win rate, which is like a pretty good win rate live. This is a good win rate live. Um, I was winning it roughly 10 big blinds per hour. And if you play 30 hands per hour, that's like 30 big blinds per 100. But, you know, again, always underestimate your win rate, right? So this is a decent win rate for live poker. Uh, there's this thin black line here down the middle. This is break even over 10,000 hands, 10,000 hands. Let's get our calculator. Let's say you play full time. You're going to play 10,000 hands. How long does 10,000 hands take you? Does any of you know, do any of you know off the top of your head? I do, but I'm going to show you how to figure it out. 10,000 hands. Let's say we play 30 hands per hour. It's 333 hours. Let's say you put in 40 hour weeks because you're lazy. You're only going to play 40 hours a week. This is 8.3 weeks, so call it two months of play, okay? Over two months of play, you will almost always win if you're winning at 20 big blinds per 100. Back when I used to play cash games live at Blasio every day, I had zero losing months. To be fair, my win rate was 1.5x this, which makes some sense. I did have a few break-even months, maybe two out of 24, something like that. So recognize that this is a really good spot. And this is why I recommend people get into cash games when they first start playing poker and first start grinding because if they can't have a decent win rate, their results are just gonna trickle up. Notice this player up here winning 5,000 big blinds. They're just crushing it. This player down here losing only 2,000 when they just run like absolute trash. So fine and good. What if your win rate's worse? Here we have seven big blinds per 100. This would be like a really, really good online player. Um, by the way, online if you play a lot, you can play maybe 5,000 hands a day, give or take. So this is more like two days of live poker, if you're or online poker, if you're playing a lot of tables. Just bang, bang my microphone. Hopefully I didn't lose it. No, it looks, seems okay. 
Okay, so notice now, again, here's the break-even line. Still very solid win rate, seven big blinds per 100, but now we're seeing some losers. We see two losers. This is actually probably a little bit of a lucky sample of 20. I would bet if we ran this again, there'd probably be more down here. Whatever. Notice though, over here, the big winner's winning like 5,000 with a bunch of 3,000s. Over here, the big winner's winning 3,000 and a bunch of 2,000s, right? So as your edge is bigger, you have a bigger win rate and you're trickling up more and more often, right? What about if you are losing negative three big blinds per 100? This is, again, not horribly bad. I mean, it's bad, but it's not horribly bad. There's plenty of worse players than this. Notice now the break-even line's here, and we have a lot of losers, over 10,000 hands. Two months of live poker, you're going to be losing a lot if you're playing 40 hours a week. If you're playing with negative three big blinds per 100, which is losing the rake, maybe even less than the rake, who knows? So recognize that. Recognize again, this player can play two months and be bad. And when? 3,000 big blinds, sometimes, one in 20. It happens. It happens. Okay? I think a lot of people don't understand variance. They think that they're just going to win. They think that they have a 20 big blind per 100 win rate in cash games, and this is going to be their results, and they're just going to smash it. By the way, the quote-unquote average is this thick black line down the middle. This is if you ran it exactly 20 big blinds per 100. So you see... These players up here are all running hot. These players down here are all running poorly. Right? But it doesn't really matter because over time, the results will get closer and closer to the black line for everybody. Although there'll still be people who run hot and run poorly. Here we have these people running poorly, these people running hot. Like I said, I think this is probably a lucky 20 people on average. Over here, same thing, right? Can you do more cash game variance charts? No, you can. Go to pokerdope.com. P-O-K-E-R-D-O-P-E.com. And... Check it out. Shout out to Jeremy Chan for turning 88 bucks into 20,000 this week. Good job. And Norkai turning 108 into 35K. Wow, nice scores for poker coaching members. Louis Fleet runs a poker coaching study session, by the way. It'll be happening, I don't think it's after this show. I think it's after my poker coaching homework today. Who knows? They do a lot of poker coaching study sessions in the, in the Discord. Make sure you get in those. If you are not, you're probably squandering opportunity, especially if you're trying to improve your skills. I also have a poker coaching homework coming up in literally 15 minutes that I need to go prepare for. So you're really seeing 18 random samples and the best and worst out of a thousand. Oh, is that what I'm actually saying? Oh, well, that would make sense. Have I, have I screwed up my data? Maybe I am. Whatever. Maybe I am seeing best and worst out of a thousand. That would make some sense. So these are 18 randoms? Sure, I don't even know how to use the program. All I'm saying is, look, look. Results are all over the place. 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 Over here, results are all over the place. Results are all over the place, right? Results are all over the place and results are all over the place. You can think you have a win rate and not have it, which is very, very important. You can run way hotter than you think is possible and you can run way, way worse than you think is possible. It happens. Well, our side have a solver in the future. Huh, be patient. Be patient, be patient. Thank you, it's a fractal. I'll look into that more. I appreciate that. You're probably right because it does seem like the big outliers are always kind of big. <laughs> anyway, look, how do you deal with downswings at the end of the day? You need to learn to win at poker. If you win at poker, the results trickle up. Would you rather have these graphs where you're losing the rake or would you rather have these graphs where you're crushing your opponents? Well, you'd rather have these and notice that your downswings aren't that bad. You're usually winning. Would you rather have this tournament result? Where, you know, over 100 tournaments, you do lose sometimes, but you have some nice wins. Or would you rather have this one, where you mostly just lose? Right? You need to learn to win at poker. So how do you win at poker? Find a game you can beat. How do you find a game you can beat? Either find really, really bad people to play against, or get really, really good at poker. You actually have control over both of those. Some players spend a lot of time finding bad players to play against. Some players play a, spend a lot of time getting really good at poker. I personally think you should do both to some extent. Now, the thing that I think I, Jonathan Little, personally have most control over is getting good at poker. I'm not the best networker, believe it or not. I'm not the best um, schmoozer. I don't really like dealing with overly strong personalities, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I don't like having to deal with getting paid. I don't like playing in shady spots. I don't like any of that. That's not for me. So what do I focus on? I personally focus on getting really good at poker. That's my goal. 
That's how I find a game I can beat. Because then I can show up to any game that will let me play. And I'll probably be fine. And that's what I recommend for most people. Fortunately for you, I made a training site, pokercoaching.com. Check it out. Next, play the game a lot. This is actually where I, Jonathan Little, struggle. Because I have spent a lot of time over the last 10 years or so really focusing on helping all of you get good at poker. But I'm making a point to play more volume. My kids are getting a little bit older. They're in school now, so it's like I'm hanging out with them all day, every day. So I've been making a point to travel more. I'm going to be in Vegas a lot more. I'm going to play more of the World Series this year, maybe five weeks instead of two, <laughs> right? I'm going to be playing more Poker Go Series. I'm probably going to try to play all of the No Limit Hold'em ones this year. And we're ramping it up a bit, which is good. Even then, it's not like it's massive volume, right? I used to play literally all day, every day. Not anymore, though. Priorities change. But if your goal is to make as much money as possible, you need to put your butt in the chair and play a lot. And number three, you got to keep a proper bankroll. If you don't have a proper bankroll, I mean, look, if you if you don't have a proper bankroll and you are, let's say, playing 100 games with a 30% ROI, you could just get wiped out. Notice, this is like negative 10,000 bucks down here. You could play 100 games and lose almost all of them. Notice, like right here, one, two, three, three players out of this 20 sample lost like 70 buy-ins. They had minus 70% ROI over 100 games. They just got crushed. They lost 70 straight. It happens. Get used to it. Are you going to get a World Series online stream this year? Probably. I finally got a place where I have decent internet and a decent computer set up. So that's good. So anyway, find a game you can beat, play it a lot, keep a proper bankroll, and you will thrive. That's going to be it for today. hope you all have an amazing day. I have to go get ready for the poker coaching homework webinar coming right up. I was going to pull it up and show you, but I don't have it open on my computer. Sorry about that. It's a good one today. Make sure you check it out. You're studying the Matt Affleck bet sizing YouTube video. I'm, there's a bunch of Matt Affleck YouTube videos. I'm not sure which one it is, but everything Matt teaches is very valuable, as Mermano says. We have a lot of great coaches at PokerCoaching.com. Did you see? We just signed up Uncle Shannon Shore. Shannon Shore has been a crusher for a long time. He was my first poker roommate. I went on my first overseas poker trip with him. It was a ton of fun. We've been good friends forever. And finally, finally, I've got them to make content for PokerCoaching.com. So make sure you check that out. We have lots more content coming from Chris Brewer. In the near future, we have Brock Wilson, Super Crusher, Justin Saliba, Super Crusher. Jonathan Jaffe's been crushing. I love his content on Poker Coaching. I watch every single thing he puts out. We have Giraffe Ganger, who just won the $2.8 million. He reviewed every single hand that he played in that $2.8 million win. It's a good site. Let me tell you something that made me feel real good the other day. I was sitting there playing the win, minding my own business. And a poker coach, I'm not going to say who it is. He is a high up coach at another poker training site. He came up to me and said, I don't know if you know this, but I love your site. And I think it's the best training site out there. Made me feel good to know that someone else, completely unprompted, wanted to give me some credit and say that I have made what he thinks is the best poker training site out there. Feels good to know that other world-class players, high up coaches, who make content, think that we do a good job. Makes me feel good. Anyway, check it out, pokercoaching.com. Good luck. Have fun if you're a Poker Coaching member. Get in the homework webinar. It starts in 12 minutes on pokercoaching.com. Good luck. Have fun. When's the next sale? Is there a spring sale? Go to pokercoaching.com slash sale or spring sale or something like that. Give it a try. Enjoy yourselves. If you're running badly, find a game you can beat, play it a lot, keep a proper bankroll. That will help you get through it. If you're not doing those three things, you probably won't make it. If you do those three things, you will make it. You know what the problem is? Most people want to play as big as they can to the point of failure. This is why poker players have the opportunity to win at the game. People move up until they fail. A lot of players, they could play 2-5 no limit and win 50 bucks an hour. Instead, they want to play 10-20 where they break even or lose. A lot of poker players don't play a lot. They want to play on the side. They want to play a little bit. I mean, I used to sit and play 5, 10, and 10, 20, literally 12 hours a day every day. Seriously. I know a lot of people think, nobody can do that. Well, I'm telling you, I did it for like two years straight. And I was always shocked at how many players would come and play on like Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays in the middle of the day and then not play weekends because they wanted to go party. I'm like, what? Those are prime time. Weekends are prime time. That's the time you need to really have your butt in the chair. If anything, take Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays off. But no, they would just play a little bit. 
And you know what? A lot of them went broke because they spent all their money and they didn't make any money. Turns out if your butt is in the poker seat, you don't actually spend a whole lot of money and you make a lot of money. It's really good. A good way to not spend money is to sit at the poker table and win. Next, you got to keep a proper bankroll. A lot of people have not read pokercoaching.com slash bankroll. Some of us start from zero. I started with 50 bucks, not zero, but with 50. And you know, through free rolls, it's actually reasonably possible to take zero and make it into 50. It'll take some time, but it is certainly possible. A lot of people think, oh, John Little's rich. He started with a ton of money and played the high stakes right off the bat. No, I started playing tiny stakes limit holding back in the day because that's the only game they had. Started with 50 bucks to my name, you know? And a, lot, and a lot of good poker players did. Same thing, right? I mean, certainly some players had a job or money set aside or whatever. I didn't. I mean, I had a job, but that's where the money came from, my $10 an hour job. And I spent 50 bucks, well spent. I put $50 online and I bought about $100 worth of poker books. And that's how I started. I worked my $10 an hour job for 15 hours to do that. It's not that much time to get yourself set up for success. Anyway, keep a proper bankroll. If you don't do that, you're gonna have a tough time winning. And look, if you only have 50 bucks, you know what you gotta do? You gotta play tiny. A lot of people don't want to play tiny. They want to take that whole $50 and put it on the line. They want to gamble. They want to get rich quick. Poker is an amazing way to get rich slowly, even though the media shows you the poker players who get rich quick. They don't show you, though, that the poker players who get rich quick very rarely stay rich, whereas the ones who get rich slowly almost always stay rich. That's just my observation. That's it for today. Good luck. Have fun. Thanks for being here. Again, if you're a poker coaching member, get in the homework webinar. Good luck. Have a great week. And I'll talk to all of you next time. Bye-bye.